If the cosmos is young, as the Bible claims, then how can we see so much of it? Today, when a photon of light is emitted from a star at the edge of the universe, it will not arrive at the Earth until billions of years later. The size of the universe is a mystery that plagues creation science and in the eyes of many, discredits the Word of God. Is the Bible wrong about the age of the earth? Cosmology has been a tough problem for young earth creation science. To solve difficult problems, though, it helps to know that there is an answer. I found by repeated testing that the Bible is scientifically reliable. So now I use that knowledge as a road map to guide me into new scientific territory. I also use present scientific knowledge knowing its limitations. But I require any theory, any new theory I generate to conform to what scripture clearly says. My best scientific insights, including my creation cosmology, come from following that procedure. Now, for example, here in Psalm 147, He telleth the number of the stars, He calleth them all by their names. Now, that word telleth in the Hebrew means to count. So God counts the number of the stars. That implies that they're finite in number, and that's emphasized by Him saying He calleth them all by their names. In contrast, verse 5 says that God's understanding is infinite, or in Hebrew, uncountable. So God's understanding is uncountable, but the number of stars in our cosmos is countable, or not infinite. So I can use that as a clue to guide me in making a cosmology, and I do, and many other scriptures the same way. During creation week, God formed the stars and galaxies on the fourth day, and their light arrived no later than the sixth day. How did light traverse so much space so quickly? Did God just miraculously, by divine fiat, move the light across those billions of light years of space? Or can science offer any insights into how a physical process that normally requires billions of years might have occurred in a matter of just hours or days. Light itself is not the answer because its speed is fixed by the medium of space. Light behaves much like other wave phenomena, such as sound in air, or even ripples on water. Today, most people believe that space is, to put it simply, Nothing. But now physicists are beginning to realize that relativistic effects are best explained if space is actually something rather than nothing. Einstein came to this conclusion and spoke about it in an address delivered in 1920 at the University of Leiden. The title of the address was Ether and the Theory of Relativity. Einstein summarized his position in a singularly succinct statement by saying, according to the general theory of relativity, space without ether is unthinkable. 
The term ether, as Einstein used it here, means space itself. And dictionaries today still use that term in that way. For example, here in Webster's Dictionary, a medium that in the undulatory or wave theory of light permeates all space and transmits radio waves or light waves. Now, Einstein's first theory, the special theory of relativity in 1905, tried to do away with the idea of an ether. But he found later on that his general theory of relativity, which he introduced in 1916, required an ether. Many people today are still under the mistaken impression that Einstein's theory of relativity does away with an ether, but as a matter of fact, a sophisticated ether is necessary to the theory of relativity for it to work. Since the speed of light is fixed by the medium of space, that leaves time as the only variable that can explain how distant light could have arrived at the Earth during creation week. Time is merely the universe in action, the rate at which physical processes transpire. Science has discovered that physical processes and time can slow down when space is stretched, warped, or bent which is actually quite easy to do. All it takes is a little matter. We can, in fact, detect the effect right here on Earth. But it requires very precise time measurement. The atomic clock is the most accurate chronometer ever invented. 2,980,000 its total error is just one microsecond, or just a millionth of a second, per year. Two billion, nine hundred and eighty-eight million. That's less than one part error out of 30 trillion. It would be like counting every blade of grass on 10,000 football fields and missing only one. It's up! Two billion, nine hundred... Two, two... It turns out that two atomic clocks, one at Greenwich, England at sea level, and the other at Boulder, Colorado at 5,000 feet above sea level, will run at different rates. Time running at different rates right here on Earth may sound like science fiction, but it is pure science fact. Time runs at different rates because the mass of the Earth distorts space and produces a gravity well. England, being lower in elevation, is further down in the well compared to Colorado. Thus time at Greenwich runs slower. To us, there is absolutely no sensation of time running at different rates because all physical processes are affected in precisely the same manner. The only way to verify a difference in time is to compare the same process running at two different depths in a gravity well. That is precisely what has been done with the atomic clocks. After a year, these clocks will measure an actual time differential of five microseconds. Many people have a hard time understanding how we can bend space. What direction can we bend space in? In order to understand what the theorists think of when they imagine bent space, we're going to have to do away with one of the dimensions of our three-dimensional space. So let's take this dimension and squash it down to a flat plane. Now we're all little flat two-dimensional creatures existing in this flat plane. Now let's wrap the flat plane into the surface of a sphere. Now the flatlanders still can't perceive that they're on a sphere. They can't perceive the air inside the sphere or the air outside the sphere. So their scientists call that air hyperspace. And the space that they exist in is simply the surface of this sphere and that's all they can perceive. This corresponds very closely to one version of the Big Bang Theory called the closed space version. And in that version, if you just travel, if a flatland creature travels on the surface of the space that he exists in, eventually he'll come back to his starting point. Now, how do we bend space? Imagine a big mass which comes along and puts a dent in this sphere. Suddenly, the sphere now has a big dent in it. 
Well, the Flatlanders can't actually perceive the dent, but it is there nonetheless, and that bending of their space they perceive as gravity. Oof. All the pieces to the cosmological puzzle are now in place, except the most important one. The question is, does matter completely or only partially fill the cosmos? The distinction seems trivial, but the effect is crucial. A partially filled cosmos is young, but a completely filled cosmos is old. The difference is due to the effect that matter has on space and time, and the issue goes to the very heart of a common misconception about the Big Bang. Typically, the Big 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 Bang, 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 bang is portrayed as matter emerging explosively from a quantum fluctuation and expanding into empty space. But according to Big Bang cosmologists, that is not the right picture. What they believe happened is that both matter and space emerged together from the cosmic egg and expanded simultaneously into hyperspace. This is a rudimentary model of the Big Bang in which the entire universe of some 100 billion galaxies is represented by just a couple dozen. And of course, space has been reduced to just two dimensions to show how it curves in hyperspace. Nonetheless, the basic principles still apply. In a Big Bang universe, matter is evenly distributed in space so that the cosmos is the same everywhere. There are minor variations locally, but overall, matter fills all of space and, incredibly, has no center or edge in a Big Bang cosmos. When viewed close up, the Big Bang and creation cosmologies look very much alike. Both appear to have evenly distributed galaxies in an expanding space. But when you step back and take a more distant view, the difference becomes clear. In a creation cosmology, Matter has both a center and an edge in space. Whereas a Big Bang universe is the same everywhere and matter has no center. But is there evidence for a centerless universe? The famed cosmologist Stephen Hawking has suggested that indeed there is little or no evidence. In his book, The Large Scale Structure of Space Time, Hawking and his co author Ellis said, we are not able to make cosmological models without some admixture of ideology. Ideology means unproven beliefs. Here, Hawking and Ellis admit that they must rely on unproven beliefs in order to develop their Big Bang model of the universe. Elsewhere in the book, they are implying that the universe is approximately spatially homogeneous. Essentially, their unproven belief is that the cosmos is fundamentally uniform. Despite the lack of evidence, their ideology requires that the universe must be uniform and have no center. What evidence there is, though, suggests just the opposite. In 1997, two scientists made observations which strongly suggest that the entire mass in the universe is rotating about a central axis, just as predicted by the creation cosmology. To date, secular scientists, who must make the observations fit within their Big Bang cosmos, have no satisfactory explanation. When matter has a center in space, it distorts space. Inside the depression, physical processes and time slow down. Today the distortion is minor compared with the size of the universe, and the passage of time varies by just a few percent across the width of the depression. But the cosmos is expanding, and in the past the universe was smaller. The redshift of light from distant sources is a direct evidence of the expansion.
Light sources emit small wavelets of light called photons. Light is literally stretched out as it passes through space, which is also being stretched out as the cosmos expands. The farther light travels in space, the longer and redder it becomes. Besides the evidence from observation, Einstein's equations of relativity also predict the expansion of space. But beyond the scientific evidence for the expansion of the universe, there are 17 verses in the Bible such as this. It is he who sits above the vault of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. That's Isaiah 40, 21 and 22. Or this one, Jeremiah 10, 12. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding he has stretched out the heavens. In the beginning, when the universe was smaller than it is today, all the matter in the cosmos was closer together. That caused an enormous depression in the fabric of space. On the Earth, near the center of the universe and deep within the depression, time slowed down. During creation week on Earth, time passed as just ordinary days. But near the edge of the observable universe, during the same period, billions of years of physical processes occurred. Thus, the most distant starlight could easily traverse the vast expanse of the cosmos from the edge to the center in just a few short Earth days. Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. During the ordinary days of creation week on earth, Light from distant galaxies traversed billions of light years of space from the edge of the observable universe to the center. God created the cosmos such that on the sixth day of creation, when Adam looked up into the vast depths of the heavens, he could see all the splendor of God's handiwork. The differential rate of time in my proposed creation cosmology is scientifically sound. Both experiments and Einstein's theory of relativity confirm that in a cosmos only partially filled with matter, the rates of physical processes would be slower at the center of the matter than at the edge. But rather than put your faith in any human theory, you should use this one as an example that God can indeed work out what may seem impossible to us. Even if my particular theory should eventually turn out to be wrong, I know that there is a correct creation model of the cosmos, because observation and scripture both confirm that God created the universe very recently. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Exodus 20.11 Is Big Bang science wrong about the age of the Earth? 